kind of move them together. You know what I'm saying? All right. Today, uh, what we were talking about, what we talked about last time uh, was uh, we were talking about the lead up to the American Revolution. When the American Revolution was building up towards, we needed to ask uh, ask some standard questions at the beginning of this. And we start talking about this. Where is the revolution at? Okay. We have. Is the revolution a true revolution? Revolution means change of the form of human life. I like to evaluate that when I'm looking at that. Okay, or is this something else? Is this something like a war in West Virginia? And I told you that historians, uh, we always look for uh, causes for some of these major events. If you were in uh, World Civ or Western Civ, when we get to the French Revolution, we talk about the multiple causes of these events. Why did they happen? To uh, have a cause, they have to be able to jump out of bed the next day and happen. So uh, last time I talked about some of the several or several of uh, the causes that you need to identify in order to move forward. One is the aftermath of the French and Indian War. The British have to take a more active role in governing their colonies. They need the colonies to uh, pay for more of uh, their defense because the British are broke. In fact, they don't need the colonists to start in another war. The British need everything to calm down. And uh, the only way they feel like they can do that is to take a more active role. And after years of ignoring the colonies, they have to take a more active role in governing them. And so you start to see that happen uh, in the first years after the French and Indian War. George Trimble, who was uh, the other prime minister during this period of time, the leader of Parliament, if you will, proposed a program that, and this is one of the last things I talked about on Monday, that, that proposed a program that would start to generate revenue for the British, would uh, put the Americans back under uh, some of the rules and regulations that they should have been uh, obeying. Uh, the British should have been forced to obey, right, but weren't. But we put them back under rules they should have been obeying uh, ever since 1650 or so. And they're going to uh, ask the American colonists to start to pay for some of the costs of keeping a uh, British army in North America to protect the American colonists. Do the American colonists need protection? Yes. Because there's already been a Native American uprising in the 17th century, Pontiac Rebellion in the 17th century in Missouri. So uh, there are Native American problems. The French hadn't evacuated any before it. So yeah, the Americans could potentially start a civil war by pushing west. So the British are trying to keep that from happening. They don't want to fight another war because they're broke, right? And they need the Americans to pay for this defense work. America. So the British start doing this in a couple of different ways. Okay? Those first two acts, the Sugar Act, the Currency Act, right, which we talked about in the last lecture, but I just put it back on the slide for you. Okay. Basically, what they are, what the British are trying to do here is to put the Americans back under the navigation rules, which said that the Americans had to stay in British ships with British crews. Uh, could only stay with England and could only buy from England. Okay. Putting the Americans back under those rules would boost the British economy, would boost the, uh, the really, the British trade and uh, the British real, I think, you know, gross national product would go up, all these big things at home, and that would be good for the British economy. They're trying, and look, okay, the Americans should always have been doing this because these laws have been on the books for uh, over 100 years. So the problem was that the British couldn't enforce them. But three and four are new. Okay? Number three is a quartering act. And in 1765, the British asked the American colonies to tell the American colonies that they are going to have to provide funds 
and they're going to have to provide shelter for British troops staying in America. Okay. So, in other words, it becomes the colony's responsibility to uh, house and feed uh, the British troops that are stationed in North America. That's a big ask because Americans don't like them anyway. They don't want them there. Okay? They see them as oppressive. They see them as limiting their freedom. They see them also as limiting their ability to leave the U.S. Okay? They don't trust them. There's a good reason for that. And so the uh, parliament asking us to pay for this army by housing it and feeding it has never been how unpopular is it? There'll be another quarter in that later on. And when we get to the American Bill of Rights and the Constitution, it's a third of the Bill of Rights. No quartering of troops. Okay? So, there is a real reason why we don't like this. The fourth is the most important. Okay? If you go back and look at that lecture uh, for Monday, you'll see that I talk a little bit about why the Stamp Act is so important. The Stamp Act is a tax. It is a tax on paper. Anything to do with paper. Okay? Everything from uh, paper that you would use to mail things, to playing cards, to newspapers, to pamphlets, to legal documents. Okay? Anything to do with paper was taxed. It was taxed at home in England. But when the British Parliament put the Stamp Act in place on the American colonists, they react violently in some places. And it becomes pretty clear that there is a growing voice here in America that does not like the British infringing on, or really well, forcing us to uh, pay our taxes. The reason there is a group of people, very intelligent people, that make the argument that we don't have any representation in Parliament. And therefore, since we don't have and we don't elect anybody to represent us in the British Parliament, they can't tax us. And it becomes really one of the battle cries of the revolution, no taxation without representation. Okay? So we see this as Americans, we see this tax as uh, illegal. And so uh, we voice a tremendous amount of opposition towards it. Okay? The American colonists, they, uh, they do a pretty good job of uh, really voicing a tremendous amount of displeasure. Okay? The most important sort of, uh, I don't need that bit. The most important, I guess, aspect of this protest that you see in groups like the Sons of Liberty, formed in New York City by Samuel Adams. They're an outgrowth, really, of a Massachusetts group called the Royal Nine, who met to uh, organize protests against the Stamp Act. Today, in today's world, we would probably view the Sons of Liberty as a domestic terrorist organization. Because one of the things that they will do is use violence, especially against British officials sent here to collect the tax. They would attack them personally. They would attack their homes. They would attack the places that they work. Okay. And uh, violence, intimidation were uh, par for the course in places like New York City, Massachusetts, places especially where you had a tremendous amount of trade going on. And you had a, a pretty bright group of people who were leading uh, these protests. Okay. You have violence, you have uh, boycotts. Organized by the Sons of Liberty, organized by uh, some of the colonial leaders, the major center refused to uh, 
buy paper. They simply boycott it. It's a pretty economic advantage to uh, the British. Okay? But this one, this one's pretty interesting. Okay, it's the first time really faced with a crisis like this, the colonists decide to meet. Now there had been a meeting before. If you go all the way back to uh, the beginnings of the French and Indian War, there had been a meeting called the Sovereign Committee of France that they had proposed to uh, the Albany French Union that was nowhere. Okay, but by uh, 1765, the American colonists and the American European leaders saw this as such a threat that they decided they should meet try to figure out, hey, how are we going to react to this? What are you doing in your colony? Okay. What are we doing? And you start to report to one another about what's going on. And it's called the Stamp Act Congress. Only about nine of the colonies ever got there. Okay. Because you got to remember, in 1765, the colonies not going to be Okay. Uh, well, you only get representatives from uh, just a few of the colonies. But it's a hint of things to come. It kind of sets a precedent. When the British do something we don't like, we protest, we scream, we yell, we holler. Okay? We meet about it, discuss what we want to do next. Okay? And that's going to become a pattern. The Americans really has a petulant child scream and holler so much that Parliament does the unthinkable. Okay. The next year Parliament revokes the Stamp Act. Okay. Does away with it. Cancels it. Was oh, that a terrible idea? It's an awful idea. Let me give you a parenting scenario. You've all seen it. Okay? Go to Walmart sometime. Okay? Child is in thermonuclear meltdown. You don't want to see your whatever it is, okay? Don't talk about Walmart anymore. Whatever. Toys, candy, food, whatever. Okay? Parent has to make a mistake, or has to, excuse me, parent has to make a decision. Okay? In that moment. A good parent sticks to their guns and says, look, I don't care what you do. You're not getting this. Okay? So you can scream, holler, hold your breath. I don't care whatever that parent says. No, no, you don't. I mean, no, you're setting down with it. Okay? Bad parenting would be to get in. Because what are you teaching the child? Right. Anytime they want to do it, anytime they want something, and holler enough and embarrass you enough, you'll get in. Okay? Dr. Phillips tells you that's the reason why you have bad behavior. Okay? So what happened to the America? We screamed and hollered, do not believe our children and never, and what did Parliament do? Whoa. Okay, we're sorry. So we'll 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 give you what you want. What are they teaching us? If we scream and holler enough, we get our way. Okay. Now, Parliament looks at us and says, what, what's wrong here? Okay. We are only asking them to pay for a part of their own defense. We are only asking them to contribute to their own defense. We're not asking them to pay for a defense of the British Empire. We're asking them to pay for a part of their own defense. Okay. The defense of their own homeland. And they're going to What's the problem? The British are not going to give up on this, okay? Because they're broke. They need us to pay for some of this, okay? So now, rather, maybe rather than be so blatant about it, okay, they're going to try a different tactic, okay? I don't care what you do. You're not going to get this, okay? That guy up there is Charles Townsend, okay? He is in the uh, in the British parliamentary office of the Union Party. All right. 
kind of carousel. He is the secretary of the ex. Here in America, he would be the Secretary of State. Okay. So, he is uh, over really the biggest funds and finance. William Pitt was back in as Prime Minister in 1767. And so, they both realized that the Americans needed to cough up at least some of the funds uh, for their own defense to help the British economy out. And so, Townsend comes up with a plan. Okay. And look, what he says is, let's try this. Okay, let's try a different approach. So, uh, rather than forcing the Americans to pay taxes, okay, forcing them to quarter troops, okay, all that other stuff, okay, he tells the Americans, look, you're going to have to pay duties on these imports. Okay. All right, tell me what a duty is. When you're talking about economics, tell me what a duty is. Tax on imports. Okay. They're designed to protect home businesses. Okay. Give me an example. You have an American company that makes a car for $10,000. Okay. Bottom line, you have a foreign company okay, because of uh, a lack of things like minimum wage and other things that make the same kind of automobile with the same feature for $6,000. Okay. Well, if you bring that car over here and you have car A at $10,000 and car B at $6,000, it's the same car. Most of us are going to go. I'm an American, woohoo flag, but I'm saving four thousand dollars. Okay. We vote with our wallet sometimes too. Okay. So how do you keep the American company afloat? You put duties on uh, imports. So uh, that company now has to pay a tax essentially to import their car. So that gets added to the bottom line. And for that company to be Okay, it has to pass that duty on to you. Okay, so now instead of being able to sell their car at six thousand dollars, they have to sell their car at nine thousand nine hundred dollars. The American car is at ten thousand. Okay, now what do you do? Okay, now you got to make a decision. Okay, now you got to make a decision. And so you may buy one or the other, but you're going to buy them based on something that you can trust. And that protects the American business. Okay? Because now it's on an equal playing field. Does that make sense? Okay. So what Townsend is actually proposing here is to hide, hide these taxes really in duties and force the Americans to pay extra for essential things that they need. Like paper, like paint, like lead, like glass, and like steel. Okay. So those five things become known as the Townsend Duty. Okay, the Townsend Duty Act. And essentially, what they forced the Americans to do was to pay higher prices for paper, paint, lead, glass. And you don't think that's a big deal, okay? We already talked about how paper is a necessity, right? So is tea. In the British colonies, tea uh, is uh, a commodity that is necessary. Okay? It's consumed by every colonial family. It's consumed at home in England. It's consumed uh, in every colonial family. It's consumed much like we do coffee today. Okay. He was usually served hot with uh, cream and sugar, or milk, sugar. Okay, and it was part of the colonial diet. It was served at every meal 
serve at breaks. They served at virtually every every colonial family needed tea. Okay. What's Townsend trying to do here? Generate revenue based on necessities, essentially, right? And it's a good plan, okay? Except, okay, except that the Americans are on to it. One of the things that's happened here in America is the Enlightenment has made it here. Okay? There are a lot of very smart people running around here in America. That are part of uh, colonial leadership, that are part of uh, this growing voice against some of these British policies. And these guys are pretty smart. And they know that this is just another tactic. Okay. Now, the other thing is to enforce this, you've got to increase Crown officials. So you're going to start seeing an influx of crown officials into some of the major cities here in America to collect the duties. I, mean, I already told you the Americans don't want any more of these guys here. Okay? When they came here to uh, collect the stamp tax, okay, they got smart and feathered. Okay? They got run out of town. They got their houses firebombed. Okay? Nobody wants that here in America. And so, once again, you're going to have a growing hostility uh, towards some of these British officials as they crowd into some of the major cities, especially places like Boston. Okay. So, they're there to collect taxes, and we know it. Okay. And so, uh, what you start seeing again is some American reaction. Okay. The most important is uh, this importation movement, okay, where uh, basically the colonies stop importing those materials. What's one way to get around the duties? You don't want to pay the duty on the flour that you're thinking about buying, then what? You just don't buy it, right? Or you buy it from another source. So, you take a wild guess. Does it lead to an increase in smuggling activity? Oh, yeah. Does it lead to attempts to get around the duty? Oh, yeah. Okay. Which only fans the flames of uh, really this, this distrust between the American colonies and uh, the British. John Dickinson writes a pamphlet, Letters from Farm Relation to Farm in Pennsylvania. Uh, Dickinson is really smart, okay, but he's kind of basically explains to everyone that reads the pamphlet that these aren't duties, they're what? Taxes. Okay, and this is what the British are trying to do to them. So they're trying to get the word out, they're trying to get other colonies to join in the movement, you know, this non-importation movement. Okay? In cities and places like Boston, you occasionally have a riot break out. Okay? In Boston, the uh, customs agents that were there to uh, enforce the, uh, the duty act, for example, would go after ships that they thought were smuggling. <laughs> In Boston, one of the ships they go after is a ship called the Liberty, owned by uh, a uh, really important member of uh, Boston society named. He's one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. John Hancock. His new signature on the Declaration of Independence, uh, Declaration of Independence is his signature. John Hancock. Okay. He goes back to stuff like this. Absolutely. The British really board his ship and search his ship for a warrant. Okay. A riot breaks out in Boston over the incident. And so now, what are the British saying? It's getting out of hand. We've got 4,000 troops in the in, in Boston. Now you've got a powder keg. Okay? 
and uh, by Father of our Spiritual with uh, more truth there than only saying the Son. Now, one of the things I hint at in the lecture on Monday, and I'm going to continue to hint at, is that one of the questions I'm asking is the Declaration, or excuse me, is the uh, American Revolution inevitable? One of the biggest problems with the American Revolution, the lead up to it, is this conflicting perception. Okay. The British here mistakenly think that Boston is the epicenter, that Boston is the only place that feels this way, that the Bostonians have lost their mind. Okay. And you start to see the Crown and Parliament spend a whole lot of time talking about Massachusetts and Boston. Okay? That's not the case. Okay? Boston just sort of kind of gets out in front of it. But there's a lot of this same feeling out there. That's why Donald Colony showed up to protest the Stamp Act. Okay? It's not just in Boston. And that's one of the things that the British have trouble with. They don't realize how widespread a lot of these feelings are among uh, Americans, and especially among uh, American elites. And so, uh, really, you start tossing this term around, okay? Patriots, people that we start to associate with uh, this movement, okay, this anti-British movement. This causes us some problems, okay? And I want to talk about a couple of these problems before we go forward. I'm getting something to drink here. One, all of you have heard of the Patriot. We here in America sometimes think that every American colonist is a Patriot. Okay? That 100% of the American colonists are uh, sons of liberty, card carrying, uh, all right, grab the musket and go stick it in a British soldier's belly, you know, rah rah. No. Uh, historians have come to kind of the conclusion that only about a third of Americans. 33%. Okay. Only about 33% of the American colonists ever support the revolution. Okay. Another one third of American colonists remain loyal to the crown throughout. Okay. They uh, don't like what the Patriots are doing and thus remain loyal to the crown. So you've got one third Patriot, one third loyalist. What about the other third? Don't care. They're trying to survive. They may be out on the frontier and they even really not give a, you know, whatever about what's going on. Okay? They may not want to get involved. They may support one side or the other, but they're certainly not going to get involved. Okay? So, at any one time, these people that are reacting and that are pushing this agenda to push their way or to push back against the British, the patriots as we call them, only about a third of Americans don't fit into that category. Okay. Two, we here in America kind of get this idea that these patriots were for independence from moment one. Okay. As soon as the French and Indian War was over and they started, the British started limiting us and what we can do, that there's this whole group out there who says, to hell with that, we're going to break away. We're going to leave war. Okay. That is certainly not true. It is still going to be a fight all the way until you get to the Declaration of Independence about whether or not we're going to be independent or not. Okay. That's not a very popular uh, stance. 
in seven, it's, it's non existent for actually in 1765, but maybe just a few you know, wild radicals who might be out there. Okay? But you're going to have to get a third of these patriots and 13 colonies to move from uh, we are British citizens and we're going to fight for our rights as British citizens to uh, over the next really 10 years. To get them to the point where we're going to say we're going to break away. And that is a long, but very bitter process. Not everybody buys into it, okay? As you'll see later on. All right. In March of 1770, we have our first incident of violence. Ironically enough, it takes place where? Boston. So this only, <coughs> excuse me, this only reinforces the idea that where's all the problem? Okay. If you ask the British where or uh, where's all the trouble, they're going to tell you Boston. Okay. The Boston Master is probably one of the most unpleasing things that happened early on. I have an idea about what happened. We're not exactly sure okay, about what happened, but I can give you the brief plot line. Okay. There's an increased troop presence in Boston. We already talked about 4,000 additional troops that were sent there to help do extra duty. The Bostonians hate them. Okay. Most of them don't like them. They have to pay more taxes to feed them and that kind of thing. They don't like them there. Okay. And so, being Americans, we kind of had a habit of making their lives miserable. Okay? Soldiers in Boston out on patrol would be harassed, called names. Okay? During the wintertime, people would throw snowballs at them. Okay? They were easy targets for those redcoats and all that. Okay? So, uh, people would call them names, they'd insult them, uh, all right, throw snowballs. And of course, those poor soldiers that had to go through uh, the areas of Boston where there's a lot of drinking and all that. Okay? Nothing like a drunken mob throwing a stone at you and hurling insults at you. In March, it's still cold. There's still some snow around. There's some ice. And uh, tensions had grown. Uh, the Bostonians, uh, not real happy. A lot of these, and of course, you always get rumors flying around that these soldiers are doing some serious war thing, probably doing some kind of thing. In March, one group of British soldiers sort of comes under attack. A mob starts throwing things at them, throwing snowballs, ice balls, rocks, oyster shells, anything. Right, and uh, the mob tries to sort of push its way towards uh, the uh, the British troops. The British troops they will bash a couple of guys in the head with uh, their muskets, push them back. And look, British soldiers at this time uh, were very well trained. They were really the best army in the world. Okay. But panic had set in even among uh, the most highly trained troops. Okay? And they're scared because they're getting attacked. They are, uh, they're really uh, kind of frightened about it. They're, they're outnumbered. Okay? And uh, they do what they've been trained to do. They form up. Okay? They put themselves in a line and they get ready to defend themselves. Okay? So that means they're thinking they can be attacked and come down. In the middle of all this, we don't know why, we don't know who, but somebody yells fire. And uh, the British fire into the crowd. Was it a British officer? We don't know. Was it an American colonial yelling at somebody to fire at them? We don't know. But the British will open fire and fire a volley into the crowd. Okay. Killing uh, 
several American colonists, wounding several others. Okay. Now, you look at this, by the way, you might know uh, who, uh, engrave, who did this engraving. It's hard to see. His name right there, Paul Revere. Okay. Paul Revere is a patriot. But do you really think that Paul Revere is uh, engraving here of uh, the Boston Massacre alone here very accurate? Uh, it's very unsigned. Okay. You have the man with the British flag launching into uh, the crowd. I mean, to make it better, all you need is for these British here be bayoneting this poor lady up here and this poor dog over here, right? So you get the idea. Propaganda. But it does happen. It's a big deal. Okay. Of course, the Bostonians are serious. The British, they do the unthinkable. The British will allow Soldiers involved in the Boston Massacre to take the trial. And they will be put on trial for man, well, for murder. They'll be defended by a law firm in Boston, headed by two very prominent lawyers, Josiah Quincy and his law partner, John Adams. Yeah, that guy's going to become president. Okay. So they actually defend uh, the soldiers in court. Get their sentences or get their convictions reduced from murder to manslaughter. Some are cleared outright. Okay. But there will be several that, especially the officers, that will bear the brunt. They'll be convicted of manslaughter. And they'll be branded and sent back to uh, England. Okay. After the Boston Massacre, uh, you have this like a pressure cooker. Everybody, you know what you, all of you know what a pressure cooker is, right? Uh, when you put pressure and the heat together, the temperature goes up because the pressure drives the steam away. Okay? If you don't release that pressure, the pressure cooker will explode. Okay? So Boston had become sort of like that. And the Boston Massacre was the explosion. Then after it explodes, there's no pressure left, right? And things calm down. After the Boston Massacre, it looks like things are going to improve. Relations between the Americans and the British improve. And you have a couple of crazy little incidents, okay? This was actually. Notice it happened two years later. Okay? So it's not really anything unreasonable a couple of years later. Okay. That ship you see up there is a British revenue schooner called the Gaspé. Right? It has been hounding American ships, searching for those that are smuggling off the coast of Rhode Island. It runs aground, runs up on some rocks during low tide. Can't get off. See those little boats out there to the side? Okay. The Rhode Islanders, who hate the gas bay, can row out there, board the ship, okay, shoot the captain in the buttocks, okay, force all of them off the ship, and then set fire to it, burn it. All right. Now, of course, the British are like, you guys can't do that. Okay. Technically, that's an act of war. I mean, you've attacked a British Navy ship, right? The British insist that the Rhode Islanders pay back the cost of the ship. Do they? No. Okay. And so things, like I said, look pretty good. Okay. Until you get to uh, about 1776. Okay. The British still need us to pay our share. And so 
They decide to concentrate on speed. And in seventh, this is actually killing two birds with one stone. Okay? Let me explain what I mean here. The British East India Company was a major British company. I think a huge company here in America today, like Microsoft or Amazon or Google or whatever. A huge. Okay, the British East India Company was responsible for trading between Britain and uh, the Far East, that's why it's called the East India Company. One of the things that the British East India Company was responsible for, for example, was getting the green tea out of those areas. Right? The British East India Company was struggling. And so Parliament decided, <laughs> Parliament, and because many of, there's an accusation at least, that many parliaments or many members of parliament actually had shares in the British East India Company, but they didn't want to say it. Okay. They came up with this scheme to give the British East India Company a monopoly over the trading in tea to the American colonists. So in other words, the only place the American colonists were going to be able to get tea after 1773 was going to be through the British East India Company. Okay. BEIC. British East India Company was going to have a monopoly. Okay. I'm out. We hate this. Okay. But the reality is that you, the consumer, could have bought tea from the monopoly cheaper than you could have gotten it on the black market. Okay. So your price isn't going to go up. It's not going to stop. It could because they're a monopoly. That's what makes the colonists furious, is that Parliament here is telling us that we have to trade with these guys. Okay? Look, Parliament's leaders like Lord North, okay, they think they're going to love this because they're going to get their tea cheaper. <coughs> so we're going to pass a law that actually makes it easier for them, right? going to make things cheaper for them, and we're going to get the profits. It's free. So it's a burden of one stone, right? <clears throat> How do we react? Horribly. We refuse to buy the tea. We boycott the tea. We, Boston refuses to even allow it to be unloaded in Boston Harbor. Because we see this as gross overreach by Parliament, which leads to the Tea Party. Okay, Sons of Liberty. Well, they, they technically were senators and sons of anyway. Patriots will dress up as Native Americans. No, no, they were Native Americans. Right? Okay, they dress up as uh, Native Americans aboard the British ship, toss all the tea into the harbor. Millions of dollars worth of damage. Okay. Millions of dollars. Pretty sure. Furious. Okay. Furious. This is the straw that broke the camel's back. Okay. After the Tea Party, things change. And uh, what begins to happen is the British begin to uh, take a much harsher stance. Okay. And uh, that horse or stance can be uh, looked at by this series of acts that Parliament passes called, uh, Parliament calls them the Coercive Act. They are so harsh towards us, we call them intolerable. Okay. So we go from a period of time of about three years where things look pretty good to all of a sudden by 1773. And trust me, they didn't get worse. Okay. All right, we'll stop here. This is where I'll pick up on Friday's lecture. Okay. So uh, don't forget about your test. Okay, that stuff is up there. Make sure you watch that video about the test. Remember that when you go in there and you start to take that test, the first part of that test, that when you start, it starts to counter. Okay, so you only have a certain time to get that done. And uh, make sure that you're at a place where Wi-Fi is strong. If you don't have good Wi-Fi, you don't know.
God forbid you're not taking on a phone. Okay? Then if you don't have access to that stuff, then go and take it in the media center or someplace that has a good computer for you to use for the weekend. Okay? And wait for the last minute. Those of you that were here earlier saw Mr. Stewart come over and we were talking about our online class. Talking about had an online class that had a final exam and an exam last week. And they waited the last minute like students always do. And if you have a technical problem, you're toast. Okay? So uh, you've got a couple of days before that first part of that class is due. Make sure that you put in some time to prep and go take it either uh, somewhere where you can devote some time and effort to it or over in the library or the media center or wherever you do have it and get that completed. I hope. Okay. All right. Good afternoon. I'll see you guys. Uh, Good afternoon. Good if you quote from the book, yeah, just stick a little point or two out beside it. Okay. Download would help file some stuff.